you are not hidden There's never been a moment you were forgotten You are not hopeless Though you have been broken, your innocence stolen I hear you whisper underneath your breath I hear your SOS, your SOS I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night It's true There is no distance It cannot be covered Over and over You're not defenseless I'll be your shelter I'll be your armor I hear you whisper Underneath your Our production manager put that video together on her own. That's just fantastic. And obviously, there's just so much going on this year. And I actually saw a funny meme this morning where it said, Do we really need an extra hour in 2020 today? Like, <laughs> but this is where we're at. And there's just a ton going on. And my goal today is to unify us. And I already gave my political sermon last week, and I didn't want to do that this year. And the Lord told me not to. He, he's told me that. People are weary, and we just got to get refocused on what matters. And we all feel it. We should feel it. It's real. And I'm convinced that this is, there's a spiritual war going on. Everything is spiritual, and our, our, our flesh follows our spirits. And there's a spiritual war going on. But even in this sermon today, it's actually going to be a little more simple, because I think sometimes you need to return to the simple truth of the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's why the Apostle Paul even said, go back to the way it was in the beginning. And he was talking about how there was some church division and some fighting. And he said, go back to when it was fresh, when you first found the love of God in your life. And even just this last week, I, I went hunting for a few days. And um, if you're new to this church, you'll always know when I get an elk because I will shave my beard. So it went well. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I started walking Monday morning, it was 16 below zero, but I was so happy just to be outside um, and away from all the noise. I had no cell service, no social media, no internet, no nothing. It was awesome. And then you walk all day and you get back to the truck and you flip the radio on and it's just political ad after political ad after political ad. Like this person is from hell, from Satan, right? It's just like, it's so negative and we all feel it. But again, my goal today is to show you that like, God is in control. 
that the Father has all this um, under his plan. The Father has all of this under his mercy. And we're going to look at a scene actually right before the crucifixion. And it's so similar to today. And, and you've heard me say this before, that I believe that we have new technology and, and I believe that we advance in certain ways, but I do believe the human experience is reciprocal. We all, we kind of just keep repeating the same thing and God is involved in that as well. And we're gonna look at a scene where Jesus is on trial. And if you have read the gospels in John 19, you'll actually see that Jesus was caught between two political parties, just like we are. He's, he was caught between the Romans who had their own form of government and he was caught between uh, the Jewish leaders who had their form of government. But the interesting thing is he was also caught between religion. The Romans had their gods and they believed that their gods were on their side because look at how much they'd conquered, look at how much land they had. And the, the Jewish people believed that God was on their side, that they worshiped the one true God. And so Jesus was actually caught between religion and politics between these two warring sides. Little history is at this point, the Roman uh, government had conquered pretty much all of Europe and uh, they owned the Middle East. And dare I say that they ruled with law and order. <laughs> Definitely ruled with law and order. They put down any type of insurrection or anything real quick. Um, they didn't mess around with that. But like us, they were a republic. We, we actually have... have modeled our republic after the Roman Republic. And there were some really good things that they had. They did have a, a judicial system. Um, they had a Congress, but it was filled with corruption. It was filled with violence. But the same thing with us is they had basically politicians who had to work their way up the ladder to have a certain spot in Rome. And so they would be sent out to all these different regions that they had conquered. And uh, if you did well in those regions, then you would be promoted. And the way you did well in that region is you kept the peace. And the way you kept the peace was by putting down any type of insurrection. At this point, again, they controlled Jerusalem, um, but the Jews were allowed to have their own kind of side government. As long as it didn't get away in, uh, of the Roman rule, they actually kind of let them govern themselves. The difference with the, you know, the Jewish government, though, is it was backed by staunch religion. Staunch religion meaning they had a former president named Moses who mapped everything out for them. And they would always go back to Moses. He was really their leader, but they were expecting uh, a Messiah like Moses because Moses predicted. He said, there will be one coming after me. But the Romans also knew that. The Romans knew that the Jews were expecting this coming king. But the thing I want you to remember is that both sides thought God was on their side. Both sides thought that God was the one backing them. And that's incredibly important to remember because then here comes this guy named Jesus. Jesus was born into a low-income family. He was born into an immigrant family. His family had to flee the Roman persecution and they went and lived in Egypt until um, he was a young boy. And then they, they came back and lived in Nazareth. Jesus was a stone cutter. They, you know, we call him a carpenter, but it was really like a stone cutter. Um, and if you looked at him, you, you wouldn't think there's a guy going places. <laughs> it actually was predicted in Isaiah, written 700 years before Christ walked the planet, that the Messiah would have nothing attractive about him. You wouldn't, you wouldn't take a second look at Jesus. So uh, I know our paintings usually like to paint him white with long flowing hair. I, I don't think he was attractive. I don't think we would have seen him walk down the street thinking like that's going to be the king someday. He was just a low carpenter from an immigrant family. But by this point, Jesus' teaching had taken hold and the Jewish leaders saw him as a threat. Jesus was a threat. And everything I want you to remember today about this is really it was a threat to power. This is why the Romans and the Jews kind of came against Jesus because it was a threat to their power. That's, that's the name of the game that we're seeing right now in our society. It's, it's a power struggle. And so what they did is they, they brought Jesus uh, to the, the council, the Jewish council, and they lied about him. And may I just say that? Sometimes when you think God is on your side and you think that you are doing God's work, you don't mind telling a little lie because you think there's a greater cause in defending God. So they had branded him as a heretic. They branded him as a troublemaker. They lied about him. 
And finally, they'd made the decision that he should be executed. Well, here's the problem. The problem was it was Holy Week. And that's not an accident. As I told you, I want you to remember that God has everything under control and that there is an ultimate plan and we play a role in it in our free will. But this is no accident that Jesus went on trial during Passover, their most holy week. And so they had a rule that you couldn't execute somebody during Holy Week. And so they turned to the Romans to do their dirty work for them. Now, again, I told you the Romans knew about Jesus, but Jesus wasn't a threat to them. I mean, they kind of looked at him as just like some weirdo who's like preaching in the woods all the time. But when they saw that there was gonna be some unrest, then they started, you know, kind of taking a second look at Jesus. But a week before this moment, it says that um, he was, he was gonna ride into Jerusalem and declare himself as king. And again, with law and order, that, 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 that's going against Caesar. That's going against Caesar. And so they were waiting, we call it Palm Sunday, but they were waiting for Jesus to come into Jerusalem and declare himself as king. And again, I can see the Roman soldiers standing there with swords and with spears, ready to put this down. And then they see him rolling in on a donkey, a donkey's colt even. And I can just see them kind of putting their swords down like this dude's not a threat. And I can even hear the sneers. I can even hear kind of the, can you, can't you just picture the Romans making fun of the Jews saying like, this is your king? This is the one who's gonna take down Rome? No army, no sword, no nothing, just a donkey? Like, good luck with that. But this sealed the deal for his death because the Jews were waiting for a Messiah. They were waiting for one to redeem them, but they thought that he was gonna come with sword in hand and with a bloodthirsty mindset and kill all the Romans and put them back in power. So when he rode in on a donkey saying, I come in peace, this sealed the deal. This guy was leading the nation astray and he had to go. In steps a guy named Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was a politician. He was a, a greasy politician. Pontius Pilate did not want to be in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not a sought after post because these, these Jews kept trying to revolt. And so Pontius Pilate wants none of this because again, he wants to get out of Jerusalem. The goal was to do good in your area and then rub a few shoulders, make a few deals, and then you would be elevated and hopefully get back to Rome. And now you got this weak Jewish carpenter standing in his way. So, Normally he would just like get rid of them, but his wife actually had a dream about Jesus and warned Pontius Pilate, don't mess with this guy. And anyone who's married, if your wife says that to you, that's a tough situation. I had a dream, hubby. That's tough. So he was really torn with this, but again, I can just picture him. If he was in 2020, he could just hear the political ads on the radio. Pontius Pilate, bad for Jerusalem and bad for Rome. Pontius Pilate is not one that we can trust with our health care. I mean, he can hear the political ads in the background. So what he does is he decides to interview Jesus. And he's, what he's really trying to do is, is as a politician, he's trying to, to keep the peace with both sides because there was a lot of Romans who liked Jesus. He wasn't violent. So they're like, this guy, he's no threat to us. His, his disciples aren't threatening to take out uh, Rome. So they, 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 he was trying to play both sides. So if this interview goes good, Maybe he can earn some brownie points back in Rome. I interviewed the guy. It went well. We worked it out. The problem was Jesus wouldn't talk. And what Pontius Pilate didn't know was that the one standing in front of him was predicted thousands of years ago. And in Isaiah 53, it says he was the lamb led to the slaughter and he didn't open his mouth. So it's hard to get someone to do something when they won't defend themselves and he gets upset with them. But uh, in order to appease the Jews, and I just want you to know, this was an unjust trial. Jesus did nothing to deserve this. But in order to appease the Jews, he had him flogged. He wasn't even supposed to do that. You don't flog someone if they don't have something wrong with them. But he has him, him flogged because it's a political move. I got to get the Jews on my side. And a flogging back then, it was a whip uh, with, with many kind of like fingers on it. And there was a lead ball at the end of it. And it just tore your, your skin to shreds. And so Pilate has him, um, you know, flogged and he brings him back. And, but his main goal was he wanted to make Jesus look weak. He wanted to make Jesus look pathetic because then maybe the Jews would have some pity on him. Like, dude, what, what are you worried about this guy for, right? 
Look at him. The Roman, the Roman government took care of him already. Jesus comes just back uh, to Pilate. He's got a crown of thorn on his head. He's wearing a yellow robe. It says they mocked him. They punched him in the face. He was bloody. He was bruised. And Pilate makes this statement. And there's going to be four statements we're going to look at in this sermon today. And it's the statement, behold. In this one chapter, we're told behold four different times. And in 2020, there's a lot to behold right now. And so Pilate parades him out in front of the mob and he just wants the mob to stop. Again, sounds familiar. If we can just appease this mob, then everything will be peaceful again. And he brings Jesus out and he says, behold the man. In Greek, it's idioho anthropos. Again, Pilate is mocking him. I, I used to read this and think like, yeah, I think Pilate had a kind of a love for Jesus. And he's like, man, this is, the, this is a man right here. He just took a beating. But now that I understand the politics of Rome, he was mocking Jesus in front of the Jews. And here's the crazy thing about this. Pilate was fulfilling scripture without even knowing it. We're gonna get into the Advent season where we're gonna talk about, it's Christmas season, we talk about the birth of Jesus, God becoming a man. One of the major shifts that I've had in my theology and just how I view the gospels is when I started understanding the incarnation. And I'll be honest, I don't even really still understand it that much. The incarnation is, a, is incredibly important, but what we've done in America, this used to be a huge deal, the Christmas season. What we've done in America is we made it all about presents and all about celebrating, which I think that's great. Like, I think we need that this year for sure, but we kind of just bypassed Jesus being born. It was a huge deal in the early church. The incarnation, God becoming flesh, was a part of the gospel. And I'm gonna do my best to explain it to you, but think about when we see an, an athlete do something sweet, like our guy, we're like, see, that, he's the man. He's the man. Or, or some musician, like, man, he's the man. But we always, again, we view it as like this macho man, these warriors, like they're the, they're, they're the men. And then you have this Jewish carpenter who never raised a finger being called the man. But listen to how Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians. But the fact is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man death came, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also all in Christ will be made alive. When Pilate made this announcement, it was in the spirit. And my point is, whoever wins next week or whenever this is over, Christ is going to use them. He's not bound by right or left. He's going to use whoever is elected. He's using everyone in the world, meaning he is speaking through them in these moments. Pilate was not a good guy. Pilate was a terrible human being. But in this moment, he announced from the spirit of God, behold the man. And he was right. What Jesus' birth did is he became the new Adam. Adam screwed it all up, which is why we're in this situation to begin with. And so Christ had to become a man to redeem man. Again, it's super deep. I'm gonna do my best to explain it to you, but I don't even really understand it yet, but that's the mystery. Christ is the new Adam. As in Adam, all men died. As in Christ, all men live. It's right there in 1 Corinthians. He is the new Adam. He's the first fruits of creation. One man writes this about it. Christ does not heal us by standing over us, diagnosing our sickness, prescribing medicine for us to take, and then going away to leave us to get better by obeying his instructions as an ordinary doctor might. No, he becomes the patient. He assumes that very humanity that is in need of redemption by being anointed by the Spirit in our humanity by a life of perfect obedience for us. By dying and rising again, our humanity is healed in him. The most important question you can ask yourself in this room is do you believe that? Do you believe that today? I am inviting you to believe this today. The good news that Christ is the new man and you are in Christ. 
So Pilate, he thinks this is going to satisfy him. He's like, look how pathetic this dude is. I mean, do you really want us to go through with this? This guy's done nothing wrong. And he, to his shock, the crowd yells, the mob yells, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. In the Greek, it's raise him up, raise him up, raise him up. And as I told you, the father was in complete control here because that is exactly what Jesus wanted to do. A week before this, Jesus told the crowds, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. The word in Greek is actually a judgment word. And what he was saying is, when I am lifted up, I will draw all judgment to myself. All of mankind's judgment. Every sin, every war, every drop of blood. Now you tell me who's the man. Pilate was right. But let me be very clear. When he took all judgment to himself, it wasn't the judgment of the Father, it was the judgment of humanity. We killed Jesus. We pronounced our judgment on him. We scapegoated him. And thousands of years later, we're still scapegoating each other because man loves to blame everybody else for their problems. Now it's mask or no mask, shut down, open, whatever it is. We, we, we always love to blame other people for what's going on. And Jesus said, yes, give it to me. Blame me. I'll be the sacrifice. I, again, I saw a great quote this week. He said, for some reason, Christians have read John 3, 16, that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, but we read it as God so hated the world that he killed his only son. He gave his only son to us. And we said, raise him up, raise him up, raise him up. Jesus is the man. This is a true statement from Pontius Pilate. And then he takes it a step further. He brings Jesus out, or Jesus is standing there, and he says, behold your king. And they shout back, we have no king but Caesar. And they didn't believe that. But again, this is a political game. They're trying to rub shoulders. They're trying to, to be cool with Rome. But they didn't believe that. They didn't believe Jesus was, his, was their king. And Pilate can see his re-election campaign going out the window. And so he takes Jesus back one more time and he interviews him again. And he says, don't you know I have the power to kill you or set you free? And Jesus, I, I would love to be a fly on Mike Pence's head and see the look on his face. Can't you just see Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords who created the cosmos he looks at him and says, you have no power over me, but it has been given to you from above. See, when Pilate announced that he was the man, it was the same thing that was announced in the garden. Out of all the things we see, I mean, I just drove through the Pintlers and saw the snow on the Pintlers. You feel so small, but out of all the things that God's created, he looked at man and says, behold, the man, my finest creation, the created being in my image, and Jesus looks at him and just says, you have no power over me. This is what my father wants. And then there's this scene where Pilate doesn't know what to do. And in front of the crowds, he washes his hands like, I am not guilty of this. And again, I would love to see Jesus. And what I think Jesus was looking at is, yes, Pilate, you aren't guilty of this. That is why I came. It was a picture of baptism. You are clean, Pilate, in my eyes. That is why I'm standing here. That's why I'm going to die. I've been preaching on the upside down kingdom the last couple months because everything that Jesus does or everything that God plans out, it's always the opposite and he flips the table on things. Jesus was the king of kings. He is the king of kings. And when Pilate announced, here's your king, he was speaking in the spirit and he was doing God's will because God was in complete control of this whole situation. And what does a good king do? A good king goes out and he fights for his people. He fights the enemy of his people. And these guys didn't even know Jesus was going to fight. And that's why he had to die because he was going to fight death and hell itself in the spiritual realms. Listen to Ephesians 4. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive the captives and he gave gifts to people. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? Hades. 
He who ascended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. Again, really deep theology there. But I don't know if you remember on the movie, The Passion of the Christ, if you've seen it, remember when he rose from the grave and there's that scene of Satan and, and hell and he just screams up. That word in Greek is actually trophies. It means when man killed him, he went and took trophies out of Hades. He took the keys, Revelation 114. I hold the keys to death in Hades. He is the king. He is the man. And so the biggest question you can ask yourself is, do you believe this? Pilate played right into the hands of the father and who's ever elected is gonna play right into the hands of the father. And the question isn't if you've, who you voted for on Tuesday, but do you know Christ has already voted for you? He's already voted for you. This gets even better. Again, Pilate didn't wanna do this, but he sends him out to the skull. That's what the hill was called, Golgotha. And I can picture the Pharisees as they're walking behind Jesus, bloodied and bashed, carrying his own cross. They felt like a glee, like, see, we're doing this for God. We're doing this in the name of God. Look, at, look, we can finally get rid of this heretic. And then when they get to the cross, they see that Pilate had put a sign above Jesus's head. And it said, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. And this made the Pharisees so mad. And I gotta give Pilate some credit here because I think it was a little dig at them. I think Pilate was like, I'm still in charge here. I'm in charge here. And they screamed at Pilate. They said, no, you can't write that. How about you write Jesus the Nazarene who claimed to be king of the Jews? And Pilate says, what I have written, I have written. And again, God was in complete control. The father was in complete control. Pilate did that through the spirit. And this blew my mind. I never knew this till this week. If you look, take the first letters of that phrase. In Hebrew, it spells Yahweh. Pilate, trying to stick it to the Jews, writes this statement out in the spirit. And when they see that, Yahweh was the name of God. They barely even said that in, in, um, at, during the year because it was such a sacred name. And Pilate was announcing, your God is dying for you. So in this horrible scene, the father was in complete control of everything. Again, it gets better. Jesus is hanging on a cross and it was Passover. So during that time, they were sacrificing lambs for the forgiveness of their sins. So the whole time Jesus was on the cross, they were in the temple sacrificing lambs. It just so happened that years a couple years before that, they extended the hours of how long they could, they could sacrifice lambs because there were so many lambs to sacrifice. The time that they extended it to was the exact amount of time Jesus was on the cross. And then you see these Roman soldiers and they're thinking like, man, Jesus is kind of a popular guy. I mean, like there's a lot of people who really loved him too. Maybe we can get some relics. And they start gambling for Jesus's garments. And a thousand years before that, David wrote in the Psalms, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothes. If you're a skeptic in here, I just wanna ask, how's that possible? It's proven by the Dead Sea Scrolls when it was written. How's that possible? But notice how they're trying to mock Jesus and the father flipped it. They were actually fulfilling scripture. These terrible people were fulfilling God's plan. In 2020, let me say, we're still fulfilling God's plan. Sometimes you don't see it right away, but we're still following through on God's plan. We've seen two behold statements. And I think these next two are the most important actually, because there's two statements that Jesus makes while on the cross. And again, I don't know how you just got whipped. I don't know how you got flogged. I don't know how you carry your cross. I don't know how you're crucified. They even said like the thorns on his head, like digging into his head, the, the headache and the, the, the shooting pains that had to go down his neck. But instead of thinking of himself, he's thinking of other people. 
And it says in John 19, 26, so when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, which is John the author, standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. 2020 has forced us into a survival mode. And it's, it's interesting how things have changed. I remember back in March and April and everyone was kind of like, cool, we got like six weeks off. And we were howling every night at eight. Well, in East Missoula, we were howling. Maybe you lowlanders that did something else. But everyone was for each other. We're gonna make it through stronger together. We're gonna make it through this. And then the summer hit. And we have completely allowed politics to divide us. I do believe that 2020 has brought out a lot in us, different emotions. It's shown us where our faith really lies. It shows us our anger, it shows us our bitterness, it shows us our fears. But right here, when he says, behold your son, behold your mother, he was explaining everything the Bible is about. And what he was saying is, take care of each other. And we can expound on deep theology and we could fight over theology. And one of his last words to us is, take care of each other. What Jesus was doing on the cross, and it's so symbolic that his hands were stretched because he's stuck between this political party and he's stuck between this political party. And on the cross, he announced those walls are human made. It's not about being a Christian. It's not about being a Muslim. It's not about black or white. It's not about Democratic or Republican. It's family. We all came from the same source. We are brothers and sisters in here. We literally are. And Jesus was flipping this and redeeming mankind and taking them back to the way it was before the curse hit. And I want you to notice what Jesus didn't say. He didn't say, vote in the right people and let the government take care of each other. He never said that. He didn't say, and just wait for Pontius Pilate to be out of office in four years and then everything will get better. He said, very simply, take care of each other. I've said this in March and I'll say it again because I still believe it, that Jesus is taking humanity somewhere. He always is. And what 2020 has shown me is we are scared children. <laughs> Who needs a father? We are messed up people who need a savior and we can scapegoat each other. We can get angry at the other side but we're brothers, we're brothers and sisters. I know Christ is taking us somewhere and I've never been more free in my life when it comes to following God. I love God, I love Jesus and Jesus loves me. I've never been more free, but I'll be honest, I don't think things are gonna get better. I don't think they're gonna get better Death surrounds us. But let me declare a truth. Jesus said, behold, I make all things new. He's in complete control. And his one thing that he just wants to say to us, take care of each other. Take care of each other. I'm convinced that Jesus isn't gonna ask you who you voted for what man you voted for, but did you vote for the man? I don't think he's as concerned what president you support, but what king you follow. He's definitely not impressed with a lot of your posts. And he's not gonna ask you 
how amazing your posts were, he's gonna say, what people did you love? And that's the simple gospel, but it's really hard. But no matter what happens on Tuesday, I want you to remember that. Who do we love? Band, you can come on up. Not long after this, Pontius Pilate never got his dream. He actually was demoted <laughs> and he was sent, they believe, to some island where he became a severe alcoholic and he killed himself. The Israeli leaders didn't take Jesus' words to heart. They crucified him. And in 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed and the Jewish people were scattered all over the world until 1948. So let me say this. 2020 will move on, I hope. We are gonna move into 2021 and before you know it, it's gonna be 2024. 2016 was four years ago and we've been freaking out for four years. Think about how fast four years just went by. That's why Christ talks about eternity. And there's, you know, there's really no such thing as time. I don't know if you know that. We have these clocks that govern it, but in the eyes of God, there's no such thing as time. There's eternity. I don't care who you vote for. I don't care where you're at. I don't care what sins you have. You don't have to know everything about theology. You don't have to know anything. Let's get back to the source of our life. Let's get back to the source of our passions, the source of our energy. And let's declare, behold the king, behold the man. And I do know this, the father is in complete control. I know we're weary, but the father's in complete control and he already voted for you on the cross. So let me declare this over you and then just take a minute to just think. May you believe, behold the man. May you believe, behold, the king. And this is a very important one. Behold your brother. Behold your sister. Behold your mother. Behold your brother. Take care of each other. Take care of each other. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.